everybody. Welcome. Day two, ATSV phase two. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker of the day. However, before I do that, I'd like to remind every all of our viewers that we do have a chat function. We will be doing a Q&A at the end of uh, our presenter's presentation. So there is a chat function or use the Q&A function, whichever you prefer on Zoom. Um, to our Facebook live viewers, please feel free to to post your questions on, on, on the feed there, and we will be feeding those into Zoom and answering your questions as well. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, Laura Rabinowitz, shareholder, Greenberg Targ LLP. Uh, she will be discussing China, tariffs, policy updates, and the US election. Certainly something that's very relevant at the moment. Uh, Laura, welcome. Again, it's good to see you. Very excited to hear about what you have to say. Great. Thank you so much, Jason, and welcome everyone. Good morning. Um, wait, good morning if you're on the East Coast, I should say. Um, so welcome. So I'd like to begin today talking about um, the recent uh, litigation over the Section 301 tariffs. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Um, there was an onslaught of litigation recently filed in the Court of International Trade. And we'll discuss this unprecedented litigation, and it really is unprecedented uh, for, not, for no other reason other than the um, over 3,600 complaints that have been filed. So we'll discuss the litigation in the context of the, the ongoing US trade dispute with China and how trade policy may be changing under a Biden administration. So just for some background, um, in July of 2018, as many of you know, the USTR imposed additional duty on specific HTS provisions. Um, these are on, um, products made in China. They were promulgated with four lists. And as importers know, this is a duty this has been a duty burden on importers. Um, this group, uh, you know, everyone in the audience today, um, particularly was hit once list three was promulgated, that hit luggage, hats, fabrics, gloves, that went into effect in September of 2018. And then list 4A covered basically chapter 61 and 62, and that went into effect August of 19. So as we know, apparel duty is already very high. Um, and these section 301 do additional tariffs were 25% for list three and 7.5% for list 4A. So then starting in September of this year, almost 3,600 complaints have been filed in the Court of International Trade asserting that the Trump administration has gone beyond its authority in imposing the 301 tariffs on list three and 4A. The litigation is not covering lists one and two, just three and 4A. And with the complaints, there's a request that all duties be refunded with interest. So the first case filed uh, was by a company called HMTX, which is a flooring company. I had never heard of them. Um, and then after HMTX, there was, as I said, this onslaught, you know, almost 3,600 uh, complaints had been filed. They're all similar causes of action, not exactly the same, but similar. Um, so just in terms of the hi quick history of uh, Section 301, um, the USTR, pursuant to its regulations, did initiate an investigation and found that uh, U.S. exports were unfairly burdened by Chinese intellectual, intellectual property policies and therefore recommended 50 billion in retaliatory tariffs. Those tariffs were issued pursuant to list one, which was 34 billion in July of 2018 and list two, which was 16 billion in August of 2018. So the lawsuits are alleging that the imposition of the section 301 duties on list three, which was 200 billion and list 4A, which was 116 billion goods, were outside USTR's original authority. So uh, first, they were outside the authority because they included other issues, such as currency manipulation and cyber theft, and not the original intellectual property issues, intellectual property issues which were in the original investigation. So that's issue one. Issue two is that under the investigation, it was the retaliatory tariffs were to be limited to 50 billion. And here, those were 50 billion was covered by list one and two. So once three and four A were issued, that was beyond the 50 billion scope. Third, uh, section 304 of the Trade Act of 1974 requires the USTR to determine what action to take, if any, within 12 months after the initiation of the investigation. 
USTR issued list three and 4A beyond that 12 month period, September 18 and August of 19. So if successful, these actions will result in refunds to plaintiffs for all duties paid under list three and 4A up until the time that the case is resolved, which will be a couple of years for sure. In addition, um, typical uh, cases in the Court of International Trade are filed under 28 U.S.C. 1581A. So uh, typically importers go through the administrative process with customs. I'm sure many of you have filed protests. And if an importer is not happy with the result of a protest decision by customs, an importer has an option of filing an action in the Court of International Trade under the general jurisdiction, which is 1581A. These cases are filed under 1581I, which is the residual jurisdiction, 28 U.S.C. 1581I. And with 1581I, there's a two-year statute of limitations to file for a refund. Now, uh, USTR's list three was published in the Federal Register on September 21st, 2018, which means that after two years, the two-year statute of limitation would run to September 21st, 2020 which is why most of the cases were filed by September 21st, by or on September 21st, 2020. List 4A was not published until August of 2019, so the deadline there will be August of 2021. So importers of, you know, of most of the apparel have until August of 2021 to clearly file those complaints. So in terms of the List three though, um, as I said, the majority of the cases were filed prior to September 21st. So those are clearly timely, but there have been plenty of cases filed since September 21st, which are alleging jurisdiction under the Administrative Procedure Act known as the APA. And the uh, plaintiffs have standing under the APA once it suffers an injury in fact. So each entry and duty payment can be considered an injury in fact. And so therefore, importers may well have standing under the APA to sue, and so they can therefore sue past that September 21st um, Federal Register uh, deadline. So um, this has been litigated before the APA, and um, I think this is a very uh, reasonable um, standing for importers. So they can file after um, September 21. So for example, if an importer was not issued, did not have a shipment of, for products under list three until let's say December 1st, 2018, arguably they would have until November 30th of 2020 to file their suit. And that would capture all of the entries. If they file their lawsuit later, they would get a percentage of the refund. So even though it's sort of, it's still unclear how the CIT is gonna rule clearly, um, whether they will accept the APA, um, importers who have merchandise on list three who have not yet filed may want to consider submitting a complaint um, under the APA to establish their standing. As I said, under the APA, each shipment is in fact an injury in fact. With list 4A, you know, which covers most of apparel, there's no issue with timeliness right now. Importers have until August of 2021. Now, as for the latest on the litigation, so far it's been just procedural motions by the Department of Justice and the plaintiffs, the myriad of plaintiffs, I should say. Um, plaintiffs are opposing uh, just the Justice Department's briefing schedule and their motions on case management. Um, there's an issue of which cases will be the test cases. Um, as I said, the causes of action are similar, but they're not all the same. And as I, you know, it's a, a lot of cats to herd, 3,600. Um, under DOJ's proposed briefing schedule, uh, plaintiffs wouldn't be arguing the merits until 2022. Um, and so plaintiffs want the government to stipulate that one, refunds will be the remedy should plaintiffs prevail. That seems pretty clear, but we want it stipulated by the government. And second, rather than waiting um, to do first jurisdictional issues and then to discuss the merits, which means we wouldn't get to the merits until 2022, um, uh, plaintiffs would like jurisdictional and merit, uh, the merit to be discussed together concurrently. So in addition, we also expect DOJ uh, to issue a motion to dismiss on the grounds that the USTR's actions are not subject to review by the courts. 
Um, this is clearly going to go to the a very high level at the Justice Department because of the amount of money involved. I don't have to tell you about all of the tariffs that have been paid. This will be a huge, this is a huge dollar value with the 3,600 cases. Um, and there's also the potential political issues involved. I mean, this is really a question of whether, um, you know, what is the deference given to the executive, uh, given to the executive branch. Now, speaking of the executive branch, this case started under Trump uh, Department of Justice, but you know, starting in January, it will be a Biden Department of Justice. So, uh, you know, I've been thinking, you know, is that going to change the course of the litigation? So that's we don't know yet, but um, I think that's something to watch. Um, but clearly, this is an important this is an important case, and whoever whoever does not prevail at the Court of International Trade will appeal the decision to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit and then also appeal to the Supreme Court. We don't know if the Supreme Court would take the case, um, but I think certainly it would be appealed. I mean, there's a lot of money at stake and political issues at stake. As I said, uh, you know, it's, it's really a degree of deference that the court is going to give to the, to the plaintiffs. What are the odds of success for the plaintiffs here of the myriad of plaintiffs? 50-50, maybe less than 50-50? Um, but filing a complaint is not a heavy lift, and I think that if importers um, have been injured by duty burdens, it's, it's something to consider. Certainly for 4A, there's plenty of time. So now, to talk about the issues behind the Section 301 tariffs, as I mentioned earlier, the IP violations, the technology transfer issues, the currency manipulation, all those issues that the Trump administration um, brought up, they're still there. Um, and uh, there's some concern uh, what the Trump administration is going to do, what the USTR is going to do in the remaining days of its administration. Um, but it seems pretty clear that the Section 301 tariffs will stay um, in the, you know, during, certainly during the, I think, during the remaining days of the Trump administration. Now, almost all of the exclusions are expiring on December 31st. So will the USTR extend those until January 20th? Unclear, I tend to think not. Um, and, but there is increasing concern what the USTR will do before January 20th. And then what is a Biden administration going to do? So I don't expect um, the Biden administration to take away the Section 301 tariffs immediately, um, you know, the 25% and the 7.5% tariffs, because then they would lose any leverage with China if they did that. Um, for the exclusions that are not extended and that expire on December 31st, um, if the Biden's new US trade representative wants to extend them, which would be an, something easy to do, they would have to issue a Federal Register notice with the notice and comment period. Um, and then, you know, there's a chance that they would then get extended. I, I think highly likely they would get extended, but there could be a period, whether it's a few months or more, um, where the tariffs are in, are, are in effect. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a really, it's a wait and see period, um, but I really do appreciate how difficult this is for importers, um, <coughs> excuse me, particularly apparel importers who are planning for 2021. So, um, you know, as I said, overall, the issues with China, the substantive issues with China that Trump uh, raised um, are still there and will have to be dealt with by a Biden administration. Um, but as Biden has made very clear, um, the way he's going to go about this will be by increased communication with the allies. Um, I think it, it will be different. Uh, he plans, he has announced that he wants to rebuild relationship with allies using institutions such as the World Trade Organization to deal with the issues of China and other 21st century issues, including very importantly, worker rights and climate change. And of course, all of this is going to impact sourcing options, so it need, does need to be followed. Um, I think another priority for the Biden administration is to increase US manufacturing. Um, and I think he sounds a bit like Trump on this issue. Um, we'll see who the new USTR is. Um, I did hear a name floated, um, the person who's currently head of federal affairs for the Alliance for American Manufacturing. So clearly she gets the post 
we know, we know her view on the issues. Um, so there will be a focus on US manufacturing. Um, a few months ago in August, um, President Trump did issue an executive order requiring government agencies to purchase essential medicines and medical supplies from domestic manufacturers in response to the COVID crisis. Um, we'll see what Biden does with this executive order. Um, but I think Buy American is how he's going to approach government purchases. Uh, during the campaign, Biden did pledge to make a historic procurement investment, in his words, worth $400 billion to boost government purchases of US-made goods and to reduce reliance on imports. Um, so clearly that is part of his effort to promote domestic manufacturing. So we've discussed China, the emphasis on US manufacturing, and now let's pivot a bit to the US-EU relationship, um, which I think will be a little bit easier for the Biden administration to repair. Um, I mean, the dispute, the Airbus dispute, the, you know, the dispute over subsidies to Airbus has been going on for a very long time. Um, it's been before the WTO since 2004. Once the WTO made their findings, the US imposed additional tariffs on products of the EU starting in October of 2019. That was valued at 7.5 billion. And that of course is on top, again, on top of the general rate of duty, 25% on consumer products, 15% on aircraft, and those lists are country specific and product specific. They cover cheese, fruit, meat, olives, scotch, all good things from the EU. Um, uh, in August, the USTR um, issued a revised list, still at 25%. Um, so it's important for importers from the EU to review those lists and really stay on top of that. Um, and then of course, last week, things escalated, the EU announced that they were moving forward with tariffs on 4 billion. Um, uh, it's both Joey, Boeing jets and other US products. So again, it has escalated. Another issue between the US and the EU is the digital services tax, digital services tax, tax. Um, many countries have already proposed it. Other countries have already Im implemented the DST, um, which is basically a tax on revenues that companies generate from providing certain digital services online, um, online advertising, data services, online marketplaces, um, which we're all familiar with. Um, and in July of 2019, the French DST legislation was passed. The USTR then said they were going to impose a 25% additional tariff on French goods. In May of 2020, the French said they are imposing this DST. July of 2020, the USTR announced their retaliation plan which is to go into effect in January of 2021, which is 25% additional tariffs on French products, and in particular, uh, makeup and handbags. So many other countries, so this is not just a US uh, French issue, many other countries have a DST, um, the EU, Italy, India, South Korea, um, and others are considering a DST, including the UK and Vietnam. So again, with the DST, with the um, uh, Airbus dispute, we're seeing the use of tariffs as a negotiating tool. Um, and of course, with China, we've seen it. So um, another uh, issue, you know, we'll see if Biden does that, um, uses 301. Um, although I think, I think there will be less of a use of 301 by Biden, less or at all um, by the Biden administration of section 301. Another Section 301 investigation, which is currently pending, is the investigation into Vietnam. It's both into the um, currency, potential currency manipulation by the government and also the use of illegal timber. Uh, comments were due last Friday. This, of course, would set a new precedent on imposing tariffs based on currency manipulation. But if this moves forward, it would lead to tariffs on products coming out of Vietnam, which, of course, includes lots of apparel. Um, there's concern that the current USTR will impose these tariffs before they leave office. So we're watching that. Um, if When Biden comes to office, uh, I think um, most are of the view that he will um, not impose the Section 301 tariffs on Vietnam. Um, although I'm a little concerned about the illegal timber, I don't think he can just walk away from that issue because that is an environmental issue. And if that is in fact the case. Um, now, in terms of other open questions, I mean, there just seems to be a list of open questions um, with an incoming Biden administration. We have a new Asian trade pact 
RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, um, not a very sexy name, um, but it was passed and signed over the weekend by 15 Asian countries, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, and the others. In, <clears throat> excuse me, this is huge. It was negotiated for eight years. They said that the pandemic spurred them to uh, complete their negotiations and get it signed, but it's a tremendous trade block. It eliminates tariffs on 91% of the goods, it covers one third of the global economy, one third, uh, I'm sorry, one third of global economic output, covers one third of the world's population. Um, this is very big. Um, it uh, creates a, a challenge for the Biden administration as they're formulating their uh, China policy, and it certainly puts pressure on the U.S. Uh, to, deepen, to deepen its involvement in Asia Pacific, without question. Um, for U.S. importers, I do think that this that RCEP creates an opportunity for U.S. importers because they frequently importer, particularly apparel importers, are sourcing from multiple Asian countries, and they're going to be able to move around, you know, import fabrics and components and move from different countries and source. And so that will lessen their duty, um, their duty uh, burden. So uh, Biden did comment on RCEP yesterday, and he said the U.S. cannot sit on the sidelines. Um, so I think while he does need to focus domestically when he comes into office, you know, we have the pandemic um, and the and the economy, in which he will focus on in the near term, um, it, it, the U.S. really can't lose sight. Um, that the rest of the world is moving forward. And I don't think that's been lost on uh, Biden. Um, and this trade pact includes China. They're negotiating with each other. Um, so Biden did also say yesterday that he does have his trade policy agenda, which he will be announcing soon after the inauguration. So we're gonna, we're waiting for that. Um, but I do think particularly because of RCEP, there will be pressure on a Biden administration to rejoin TPP. Um, I think an edited and perhaps a rebranded TPP um, I mean, it was the left-leaning Democrats who uh, were against TPP, particularly because of the labor provisions and the environmental provisions. But if those can be edited and, and I think rebranded, I think um, following a NAFTA USMCA route, um, I think uh, uh, there's a chance that, well, I think certainly the Biden administration will be looking into that. So the final issue I wanted to discuss today before we get to questions is, um, Biden has already uh, signaled that he's going to ratchet up pressure over China's handling of its uh, human rights record, um, and there already is a focus on forced labor for imported products into the U.S. Um, a number of federal agencies are, um, are dealing with the issue of forced labor for imported products. The Executive Assistant Commissioner of Customs, Brenda Smith, recently said CBP will not tolerate modern slavery in U.S. commerce. We expect every U.S. importer to ensure its supply chains are free of forced labor. So pretty clear, right? Um, importers are really on notice that they must ensure that their imports are free of forced labor, indentured, child, or convict labor, known as forced labor. Um, and this is important to protect, you know, brands, the brand, um, and integrity of, integrity of their supply chain. So importers really have to vigorously tackle the issue of forced labor and expend an effort. They need to strengthen their internal controls, have visibility into their supply chains, including component sourcing. Um, importers really have to prepare for increased enforcement by customs for goods from all, country, uh, from all countries, particularly from China, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Um, both customs and Congress are focusing on China's Xinjiang region, on the, on the Uyghurs. Um, recently, we've seen Customs has significantly increased their enforcement, including issuing a finding of forced labor. It was the first since 1996. It's for civil penalty and additional withhold release orders, known as WROs. On, those are on the importation of specific products. In fact, in 2020, Customs issued 13 WROs, which are promulgated when CBP has reason to believe that the imported products are made with forced labor. Customs authority um, for WRO stems from 19 USC 1307, which states that all goods manufactured wholly or in part in any foreign country by forced labor 
under penal sanction shall not be entitled to entry at any of the ports of the United States and the importation thereof is hereby prohibited. Pretty clear. Uh, such merchandise is subject to seizure, exclusion, and criminal investigation of the importer. Section 1307 covers not only finished goods, but also goods in part. So therefore it covers imports as well. Um, more detentions and penalties are expected from customs. Importers really have to review their supply chains, as I said, and their internal controls. They need to do risk assessments. They need to do on-site visits. They have to ensure that all suppliers have um, not only are adhering to a code of conduct, but that code of conduct really needs to have edited, updated versions of provisions on forced labor. They need to edit their customer agreements because to protect themselves against potentially late or missed deliveries. Um, it, I, I, the, import, the importance of third party audits covering forced labor cannot be overstated enough. Um, importers really are advised to review their component sourcing, you know, questions of how far down the chain do they need to go, that really needs to be addressed. Um, and because, as I said, a number of federal agencies, customs and other agencies, the Department of Labor are looking into this issue, and also Congress has already addressed forced labor, and that issue is only going to become more in the forefront, I think, um, well, potentially in the lame duck, but certainly in the new Congress. Um, and the pending congressional legislation impacts both private and public companies. Um, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which was recently overwhelmingly passed by the House with bipartisan support, states that all goods produced, even in part in Xinjiang, will be, will be deemed to be made by forced labor and banned from import. Unless the CBP commissioner determines by clear and convincing evidence, question what that would be, um, that it for specific goods were not produced wholly or in part. So um, importers are unnoticed. This reminds me of the executive order that the Trump administration um, enacted on products made with North Korean labor that by definition were made, are made with forced labor. Um, there's also pending the Uyghur Forced Labor Disclosure Act, which affects um, public companies and it requires them in their SEC filings um, to disclose imports of goods or materials sourced from Xinjiang. That's huge for public companies. So the Disclosure Act was also passed by the House, um, but it does not have bipartisan support. So what we think will happen is that most likely the bills um, will be, will certainly will be edited um, and maybe in fact be combined. Um, we'll see if, if they're raised during the lame duck or not until the next session. Um, but importers really uh, need to track this legislation, prepare their supply chain, because um, they need to be compliant uh, when, this, when, the, when the versions of these acts uh, do get passed and signed by the president. So thank you very much and um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Jason, you're on mute. Sorry, oh, lost, there my, you are. lost my window there. I have oh, like okay. 10, there 10 windows open and I was like, where is it, where is it? <laughs> um, thank you, Laura, that was very detailed. Um, can, you can you do me a favor? Can, there's one bit of information that I found particularly important that I think people might be interested in. Can you repeat the deadline for, the, for filing complaints for the 4A? That's August, August of 2021. Got it. Okay. And can you can you give an example of something that would be um, like a submission, something that would be relevant to the apparel industry, something that people might be concerned with? You mean with the three hundred one? Yeah, well, with the four A for the four A. With the four A. Yeah. So, like, imagine imagine you're you're an importer or you're you're a, you're a brand. What is an example of something that might be um, a submission for that? Oh, a submission. Yeah. yeah. So as I said, um, oh, I thought you said submission. So it, yeah, it's not a heavy lift. Um, it's at this point, all that needs to be done is file a summons and complaint. Um, 
importers, I suggest that importers, I mean, they know they've been paying duties, but they uh, can should review with their logistics department, with their customs broker, find out how much duty they've been paying on list 4A products. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's at all significant, uh, worth filing a complaint. All right. Yeah, being yeah. one of the masses, jump on the bandwagon. Absolutely. Yeah. Make your voice heard. Um, yeah, yeah. So what 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 is entailed in in the filing a complaint process? How 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 difficult is it? Um, you know what what is what is the overall process and how do you do it? Um, I mean, you need a lawyer to file. You know, you need so you need a member of the bar of the Court of International Trade to file. These actions are in the Court of International Trade, mm -hmm. so you need to to hire somebody who can file in the court. Um, and right now it's um, it's not like typical litigation where com you know companies know there's you know depositions and all. Um, we're not there. I, I don't think we're ever going to get there with with this case. Um, right now, it's just really procedural, and most companies are just filing their complaints and then sitting on the sidelines. We're waiting for a test case. I mean, there was, it's just unwieldy for the Justice Department to deal with over 3,600 cases, so or about 3,600 cases. So. Um, we're just trying to figure out the procedural, but but for importers to know, they can just file a complaint and and then for most companies, just just watch what happens. But this way, but the importance of filing a complaint is that they um, uh, protect their rights to get it in before the statute of limitations. So something that's very important. And I, yeah, and I don't think it's too late. I really do think the Administrative Procedure Act um, is a valid claim for products on list three. Right, thank you. Um, switching gears just a little bit. I know, especially we discussed a little bit about this yesterday, uh, about the issue in, in Xinjiang, uh, China, um, and the forced labor issues that are going on there. Um, what, what would you suggest for importers? What, what can importers do to protect themselves regarding their shipments from those areas? Yeah. Um, yeah, you. Re this is very, very important to do it prophylactically. I think we're going to see a lot more enforcement by customs. Um, I, I mean, I mean, now we have a pandemic, but uh, on-site on-site visits, you have to do on-site visits by company officials or whatever consultants um, the company has. Hiring third-party auditors, very important to have that. You know, unannounced visits, have everything documented because. If customs were to detain a shipment or uh, importers are not going to have a lot, you know, a big turnaround time. They have to really be organized in advance. Um, update suppliers code of conduct. Um, make sure those forced labor provisions are very strong and, you know, edited with the updated language. Um, and then if you are supplying, you know, a retailer, um, you you know, somehow need to protect yourself because you might be late. If customs is detaining a shipment, you know, you can't just assume that your merchandise is getting in and out of the port. Um, so you might want to also with your supplier agreements, protect yourself there. And um, so um, this is this is going to be a very difficult issue, particularly because it's not just finished products, but it's components. Got it. Thank yeah, you. this is really, importers have to really take this on. Yeah, this is it, a... Not this something is a, to be, this is a big issue. Yeah, not something to be taken lightly. You know, this is something that can directly affect your business negatively from not only, um, you know, like you said, from a monetary and logistic standpoint, but bad press, you know, stuff like this gets out that your your brands are involved and your supply chain is is violating these these very crucial human it's, rights issues. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The uh, brand what, what, exactly. what is the, what is the saying? It takes a certain uh, takes a uh, uh, a long time to, to 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 build a brand, but only minutes to destroy it, or to yeah. have it. Yeah. So, uh, exactly. and, and you know, what to your point about the third party, um, you know, compliance uh, platforms. We have RAP is a very effective one that could be used for this type of thing. And if you think about the cost saving, it's almost like car insurance. Imagine you buy a brand new car and you only get liability, and all of a sudden you get a new car wreck and you're you're out thousands of dollars. Like the same same principle applies here. Spend a little extra money protect your your brand, protect your supply chain. Exactly. It's okay. just, I would say, you know, I was all set for forced labor to be the number one issue for US customs for 2020. 
I really thought, you know, at the beginning of the year, that's how we were ramping up, you know, and then the pandemic started and they had to, you know, switch and everybody, you know, had they had to deal with that. Um, um, and I think customs has done quite well with the pandemic, actually. Um, right. Hopefully we'll continue. But I, but I think that, but I think the focus is on it now. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's gotten better over time, especially the last decade. I feel like there's a progression year over year to focus on these issues and, 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 you know, you're starting to see legislation happen. So that's very exciting. Yeah. I but mean, I if you look at the old WROs, they're, they're old. I mean, they've been around for a long time on tea yeah. and cocoa and, um, but, and I think this is something that a Biden administration is also going to, you know, fully embrace. Very excited to see what happens. I should say continue to embrace. Cause I think yeah. the, I think the Trump administration did too. Yeah. Speaking of Biden, um, the Biden administration, <laughs> um, do you think, do you think the Biden administration will try and join TPP? Have they been vocal about it? I haven't seen anything to that effect. Nothing definitive, at least. What do you, what do you think? Um, no, they haven't. They haven't made a statement on TPP. Um, you know, and as I said, it was the left-leaning Democrats, you know, in the Clinton-Trump election, they were the ones, you know, um, who did not want the U.S. to join because of the labor, the, particularly because of the labor issues. Um, I think RCEP is huge that was signed over the weekend. And I think that's really, I really do think that's going to pressure Biden administration um, to perhaps join, you know, a, uh, as I said, a, you know, an edited, renegotiated, rebranded TPP. Um, I do, I think the US, it's very clear that the Pacific Asia bloc is moving forward and yeah. the US is being left out of that. Yeah. I mean, you cannot compare the markets, you know, the EU and, and the Pacific. And globalization isn't going anywhere. You know, it's going to, the, uh, as the world continues to shrink and technology continues to progress and logistics gets more uh, effective and lead times are shortened, it's something we're certainly going to have to embrace in the future. So it'll be very interesting to see yeah. what happens here in the next year or so. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I really think the administration um, will will not want to be criticized for doing nothing. And, and I think Biden's statement yesterday, I was waiting over the weekend, I hadn't yeah, he hadn't said anything. And then finally, I know yesterday he made a statement and said, the U.S. is not going to stay on the sidelines of this. So what form it takes. Um, How long it takes, we'll have to, uh, I guess we'll just have to see, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. How long it takes. So, um, right. But I mean, it was so interesting to me. Like I thought, you know, when Trump would talk about the new NAFTA, and then there are new things in it. You know, it's, you know, higher regional value content for North America, the labor, the environment. I mean, certain groups really were able to input and it is, it was rebranded. Um, so I, I suspect that will happen. Great. We're very excited to see what happens. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, we don't have any other questions here. So uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. I do want to remind everyone that um, we do have a virtual dashboard. Um, I will post it right here, and they'll also be posting it to the to the Facebook listeners as well. Um, there is a matchmaking function on the dashboard. If you scroll down one time, you'll see it. The button will be flashing green. Um, what it is is a essentially the show floor taking place of the show floor virtually. So uh, it's a great place to network. Um, there will be ATS staff in there to answer any questions. Um, and then uh, as well as uh, direct unity or sourcing needs, we also have the different pavilions and our exhibitors in their uh, different locations on that same dashboard. So make sure to go check that out. Um, Laura, thank you so much for your, your insights. That was very, very good stuff. So hopefully we'll get to see you in person soon. Oh, I hope so, yeah. yes. <laughs> Next year for sure. Uh, absolutely, okay, well, take care. All right, bye everybody, thank you.